Hello! I wish I had a funny video for you today, but what I have instead is a serious video and I want to talk to you about why you should not join Teach for America. I have been meaning to make this video for a year now, ever since I quit the organization in January 2014. And I haven't been able to make it because I feel like I risk losing friendships. And I feel like I risk angering and disillusioning students and parents that have to deal with Teach for America in their everyday lives. But I have decided that whatever friendships I lose, that's, that damage is smaller than the damage I cause if I stay silent. It was also around this time two years ago that I had to choose whether I accepted or declined my invitation into the program. So I know that at this very moment there are people that are either questioning whether they should join or decline going into the organization or they're second guessing their acceptance into the program. So I make this video with the hopes that it will help those people make the decision of not joining the organization. And I tell you my story because that's all I have and I know that other people will have different experiences through Teach for America but my experience was so strong that I can't I can't keep quiet and I cannot keep it to myself. What I really want to communicate to anyone watching this video is that TFA is not interested in fighting educational inequality. It's the very opposite. They're interested in furthering educational inequality. They're interested in destroying the public school system. And let me go even further and say that I think TFA is very interested in killing that revolutionary spirit in the people that it attracts. Teach for America is supposed to be a nonprofit organization that helps fight educational inequality. It does so by bringing racing graduates into low-income communities and training them to be teachers. Often, the argument being that there is a lack of teachers. Let me distinguish individual people that make TFA from the organization as a whole. The people that go in are good-hearted people. So please don't think I'm referring to individual teachers. I am referring to the systematic way in which the organization functions and the way that it sets up its teachers and the students that come into contact with them to fail. And the teachers that are able to succeed, I think they are truly just angels. I think they are people that are truly meant to be the teachers and they rise above. But then number of teachers that are capable of doing so is so small that I don't think it's worth keeping an organization like this around. Teach for America, which I will from this point forward refer to as TFA, is a highly regarded organization, at least it appears so from the outside. It is considered to be more difficult to get into Teach for America than it is to get into Harvard. And the process is extremely difficult and long. You have to send an application, a written statement of purpose, have excellent grades and excellent recommendations from your professors. On top of that, there's an interview over the phone. And then the very last step is an in-person interview. And this process took about three to five months. And so by the time that you get accepted, you've internalized the fact that, damn, this is such a highly regarded organization and I've made it that I don't think that very many people actually decline once they get into the program. This program is also supposed to be an alternative route to becoming a teacher. Instead of going to get your master's degree and your credentials and then going to teach, you can do it all at the same time. You start by doing a six-week summer training and then in the fall, you start teaching students. And during those two years that you're in Teach for America, you go to classes at night. Classes which are supposed to be at a university, which will give you your credentials. And if you so choose to, you can finish a master's program at the same time. Now that it is two years later and I have some time to kind of think about the experience, I now consider it the worst mistake I've ever made in my life. But let me give you a little bit of context as to where my mind was two years ago when I decided to join. There were two big realizations that drove me to this program. The first one being, I kept meeting a lot of people that came from even better schools than I went to. I went to a state school and I kept meeting people from Ivy League level schools that had no jobs. And I kept thinking, I need to have a job when I graduate. I have debt, my 
mom can't pay for everything for me so there was fear in me that I, I need to secure a job after I graduate or before I even graduate let me correct myself the second biggest realization at the time being knowing that the world is so messed up I want to do something positive with my time and my job and my career and my teachers my entire life have always pushed me to be a teacher and even though I already knew way back when I started college that I didn't want to be a teacher I think the fear that I need to have a job and I didn't know what job I was supposed to have it made teaching seem all that much more appealing this is obviously not a good basis on which to make decisions but I just want you to understand where I was and before I go any further let me just clarify that the majority of the people that go into TFA go with that realization of them wanting to have a positive impact in the world and this is how TFA seduces very good students very good hearted people to come and join their organization and if TFA has one redeeming quality is that its teachers for the most part are some of the most good hearted genuinely caring people that I've ever met there is no other positive to teach for America except for that the teachers it attracts Going back to giving you a little bit of background about myself, I studied Spanish and Latin American studies in college and when it came to teaching, that's exactly what I wanted to teach and the people that I wanted to relate to, students like me, immigrants from Latin America that were now in Los Angeles, struggling to learn the language, struggling to deal with being in two cultures and questioning who they are if they've lived in two places or more their entire lives or experience living in different places their entire life of course who knows how many people that apply to tfa want to teach in los angeles and priority is given to people that are married that have houses here or maybe they have somebody that's sick they have children so obviously i was not given priority and i was placed in the mississippi course and once that your application is accepted and you're placed in a region you have no say whether you can change where to go you just say yes or no and to me it seemed like such a hypocritical thing if I said no to teaching students that were black rather than Latin American because the entire spirit of my studies came down to the fact that race does not exist yes we have different color but ethnicity and race they're just made up and at the end of the day we're all just human and we're essentially struggling with the same questions and problems and so I didn't even think about it twice I said yes because I wanted the experience of teaching students in low-income communities which is how I grew up I'm a student from a low-income community of course I should have seen this as a big red flag because part of the Teach for America mission is that it's supposed to place teachers in front of students that are like them um, because this will of course empower the students but again for whatever reason it just it didn't click that their own mission statement was not coinciding with how they were treating me as a teacher and as an applicant first of all TFA is not the right place for anyone to learn how to be a teacher I just previously told you your promise that you can get a master's degree at credentials and you'll have a summer training to help you learn how to teach in my region of Mississippi getting a master's degree is not even an option I was lucky enough that I was close to a university but many of the teachers that are in the regions they have no way of getting to a university so that option is not even presented at all the classes that we took in order to get our credentials were taught by TFA staff who were previous teachers um, that went through the experience before us or current ones that were so outstanding that they should be teaching others how to be teachers if I remember correctly I was to take about nine classes a per semester and not all of them were in regards to foreign language I would say that a maximum of one class per month was in regards to foreign language and on top of that the summer training did not prepare me in any way to teach the students I was meant to be teaching by the time that I went into Teach for America in June I already knew I was going to be teaching high school students Spanish when I went into the summer training they placed me in an elementary school teaching first graders so I spent my entire summer learning how to deal with five and six year olds and there was very little teaching of Spanish and although I did 
technically learn the overall techniques of how to teach Spanish in the way that they wanted me to teach them, I was teaching children that couldn't write yet. They were just learning to write, just learning to be in a school setting. So every skill that I might have learned in the summer didn't even apply to the students that I was to teach in the, in the fall. And the children that I met were wonderful, so I don't mean to say that that's a waste of time. But if you're advertising your training as preparing you to be a teacher, then that's, I mean, that's complete false advertisement because I was not taught to be the teacher that they had placed me as. During that summer, I had maybe two to three sessions in regards to how to be a foreign language teacher. Most of the classes that we were exposed to in that summer boiled down essentially to learning how not to be racist. They taught me about the history of Mississippi and the racial tensions and, you know, the different situations that the students are going through, which is great. Um, but I didn't need to go an entire summer learning about it. I spent four years learning about the oppression of Latin American people and, of course, the oppression of African Americans in the United States is not the same as the people in Latin America, but they're very similar themes. I didn't need to spend an entire summer learning about racism and stuff like that. And now I don't mean to offend anyone, but this, these classes actually benefited a lot of the people that came from extremely wealthy backgrounds, that they had never experienced racism, they had never experienced any of these, the state of minds that somebody of a minority or in a position of oppression could go through on their daily lives. So I don't mean to say that those classes were not necessary, but I should have been learning how to be a teacher, not how to not be racist. I already have an idea of how to not be racist or what situations can be misconstrued as racism. It's And I guess what I'm trying to say is that it felt like the time was not used efficiently. And I'm curious as to how that training differs in other regions. Like I said, I can only speak from Mississippi, but the training in my region is not good. So if you're going to Mississippi to learn how to be a teacher, you're putting yourself in a position where you have to teach yourself through experience and through failure how to be a teacher. When I began teaching in the fall, I didn't even know fully how to still teach foreign language and the only thing that made me feel confident when I stepped into the classroom is knowing that Spanish is my first language and that I learned Spanish in elementary school and middle school because I lived in Costa Rica and Nicaragua and then when I came to the United States I continued to learn Spanish and I continued to learn Spanish in college so that made me feel very confident but out of maybe 15 people that taught foreign language which I think most of, if not all, were Spanish, there were only four of us that were actual native Spanish speakers. And I was the only person out of that entire foreign language department that actually studied Spanish for their college discipline. And that's actually the most alarming characteristic of this program. Very small percentage of people that go into this program will actually end up teaching while they studied in college. In TFA, if you take maybe four or five classes throughout your college career in a subject, that qualifies you to teach it in a public school. So not only are you having to teach yourself how to teach your discipline to other people, you're having, if you've never, if you didn't really go deep with that discipline through college, you're probably trying to teach yourself about the discipline as well. So you can try to imagine how difficult it must be for every teacher to try to juggle them learning the discipline and then learning how to teach that discipline and putting lesson plans together, grading papers, learning how to deal with students and their parents. And this is all happening at once. When the fall starts, it's all happening at once. I can only think of very few people that actually taught the subjects they studied in college and they actually taught the students and the grade level and the subject that they, would, that, they, that they were to teach in the fall. So as you can probably tell, this program is just a hot mess. <laughs> and what this results in is the students having terrible education 
because as you're trying to learn and you're failing just like you fail when you try to learn a new skill you're experimenting on these students and that's their education and when you think about the fact that many of these students are constantly seeing TFA teachers come in and out you realize that their education has been under constant interruption because they're not entirely being given people that know how to teach whether they're good-hearted or not they're just not getting the same education that they would get at any other public school that didn't have TFA in a way that has to be very damaging to them I think it makes them feel like they're not good enough for the teachers to stick around when in fact it has nothing to do with the student if you're in somewhere foreign that you know you're you're now with your family you, you don't know the place you're you most likely have very little reason to stay. So very quickly in my experience with Teach for America, I realized TFA is not here to fight educational inequality. It's here to further prevent that these students will receive good education. The presence of TFA in a school means that students' education will continually be interrupted they will be continually experimented on in ways that wealthy students will never experience. And a very big reason I think that public schools go along with TFA is because to them it's just cheap labor. They don't have to give more money for a, a teacher that has more experience. They can just give the very minimum and have these new student teachers come in and know that Teach for America is going to supply them with more and more teachers when they go away. And so not only is the student being affected on an individual level, but the school as a whole is being destabilized by these people that keep coming in and out. And so as the students' grades go down because they're not having good educators educating them, um, what this does to the school is, of course, that the test scores are lower, and so the government can come in and say, hey, we're going to shut you down if you don't raise your score. And so what happens when schools get shut down is it's a perfect opportunity for charter schools to open up down the block and now kids have to go to a charter school. And I don't entirely understand what a charter school, how it works or how a charter school can do away with public schools. I only understand that a charter school can do whatever it wants with its money. And so essentially, if you take away public schools, charter schools can become businesses that make money for private individuals. While I'm talking about charter schools, throughout my time in TFA, there were so many presentations from charter schools. I met so many people from different charter schools, I think with the intention that when you leave TFA, you're going to go work for the charter school. And to this day, I actually get emails from charter schools telling me, hey, former TFA alum, which I'm not because I quit, come teach for us because <laughs> we're just like TFA. We have these high ideals, so come teach for us. So I can totally see that this is a true criticism of TFA. And this isn't the only way that TFA is working towards making profit out of education. When you go into TFA, you don't have a job in the summer. I mean, you technically have a TFA job, but it's not a job, it's training. So they don't pay you. You're either supposed to support yourself if you're rich enough or take out a loan or if you are low income they give you a small grant. So I had to take, they gave me a small grant and I had to take a loan for whatever else I couldn't um, afford um, with their grant. And so not only do I have to pay the loan back in the two years that I'm there, because I quit I had to repay back the training that I did that summer and all those classes that I was going to. I had to pay like two thousand dollars back to tfa in in mississippi alone an estimated 20 percent of tfa quit and so 20 percent of the money that tfa put in mississippi they're gonna get back and it's not money that comes out of tfa it's money that comes from donations from wealthy people and so every year wealthy people donate money for tfa to function and the people that cannot function within TFA when they quit, they give that money back to TFA. But then there are still people donating money for the following year. So TFA actually makes profit out of people failing their program. And if you can imagine this happening on a nationwide level, they don't have a reason to make sure that every person that goes into TFA succeeds because 
them failing actually makes TFA succeed in regards of to profit. Now, among all this craziness, I still wanted to finish my two years in TFA because I felt it was important to me. I put myself in that situation because I wanted to learn how to teach students that were coming from a low income community like me. How could I how could I connect with people like me? I wanted to learn that. And so I made it my goal that I would stay there the two years. No matter how how terrible I felt about not being an effective teacher, no matter how difficult the challenge was. The reason I ultimately left is because my health deteriorated to such a terrible state that I felt afraid. I felt like I felt like I didn't know what was gonna happen to me if I stayed there because I was so depressed, anxious, and stressed every single day that I was there. And most of these pressures did not come from my students. They actually came from being a part of TFA. The very first day that I was in TFA, I remember meeting a person that had been there for like five years. They were still teaching and working for them. And he right away came out and told us, yeah, TFA is a cult. And I had actually no idea what he was talking about because I never really did enough research on the organization to really go through all the criticism that people gave it. But looking back, I actually agree. So let me tell you how TFA is a cult. Let's take a look at the word cult. Um, I googled some definitions and I came up with a cult is a system of devotion or admiration towards a particular figure or object, a small group of people having beliefs or practices regarded as strange. Cults employ mind control and deceptive recruiting techniques. Uh, finally, cults are after your obedience, your time, and your money. And I actually found some signs as well that go along with that. In a cult, you will find that there is exclusivity. Um, how is TFA very exclusive? It's very difficult to get in. Only about 5% of applicants or less get accepted into TFA. Um, so to be a part of TFA is celebrated. To have TFA on your resume is seen as a very high accomplishment. At least that's kind of the, the thinking that they drill into your mind as you're applying to TFA and as you're actually there when you're a part of it. Sign number two, persecution complex. Us against them mentality. Um, well, yeah, TFA essentially stands for a fight as you as the individual against the entire educational system of the United States. I don't remember exactly how they get this narrative in your head, but there's somehow this idea that you have to be exceptional for your students, that your student has been failed by every other teacher, school, person that they've ever come in contact, and therefore you have to be that one solid rock presence in their life. How you're supposed to do that for 120 or so students, they never really explained. But you are expected to just to be that, to be exceptional. And so again, that's another you against them kind of narrative. Sign number three, in a cult, there's control. From day one, I had no control about my position within TFA. You're not allowed to negotiate your pay. You're not allowed to choose where you go. You're never even given reason as to why you're put in where you're put. You cannot just come to your own conclusions because you need to as a human being, not because anyone is talking to you in any way. Um, not only that, but during the summer, the training camp, it felt very much looking back like a military boot camp you have a strict schedule every day and of course they don't tell you you know you need to wake up at a certain time but undoubtedly you do come to a very specific schedule because you need to stay on time my bus every morning would pick me up at six in the morning and take me to a school that was very far away because it's a rural community in mississippi uh, and we would get there about 7 7 15. so Every single day I had to wake up at 5 a.m. 
so that everybody can use the shower in the morning because we share the um, a dorm with four four people total. So every day I woke up for six weeks at 5 a.m. 8 by 5.30 a.m. by 6, 6.10, I'm on a bus every single day. Um, and then you teach until like 2 or 3 o'clock. There's a few classes um, after 3. You get on the bus. You get to the back to the university. You have another few classes at times. And the few hours that you have between when you need to go to bed and, you know, when you got done with classes it's time that you now need to work on your lesson plans um if you're still learning about your discipline you need to learn about your discipline if you still have not passed the state test for whatever discipline you're teaching you need to be studying for that so there's very little time to do anything that makes you feel good all you're doing is just hard work from very early in the morning until 12 at night even though you're gonna wake up at 5 in the morning and of course, this program is serious and it's about hard work. But you as an individual, you need to have an outlet just to function, right? But you're not. You're under so, so you're under such high stress um, that, yeah, your day is in, entirely controlled by this program. I forget what number I'm on, but another sign is that you have special knowledge. In TFA, this meant that your vocabulary was filled with weird acronyms that i can't even remember because somehow thankfully i've been able to block them out of my mind um and just like i keep saying tfa tfa the moment you land in whatever region you land and you are part now part of teach for america you no longer ever again say teach for america it's tfa and no one ever tells you it's wrong to say it's tfa it's just what everybody says so you just say tfa and there are so many acronyms to refer to your leaders, to your discipline, to your classes, to just everything. And this happens so that even when you are in your year and you're teaching in school and you're surrounded by other teachers, you can turn to your TFA colleague and speak to them with words that very few people are going to understand. And then you can turn back to the other non-TFA colleagues and you know go back to normal speak so what this does is create a sense of inclusion within tfa members but it also creates a sense of isolation with anybody else that isn't in the program next sign no legitimate reason to leave former followers are always wrong in leaving i already touched on the subject a little bit because technically the reason for you being in tfa is such such a high ideal you're you're there to fight educational inequality that if you leave tfa must mean that you no longer care about fighting for educational inequality you no longer care for having a positive impact in the world again nobody ever comes out and says these words to anyone in particular but uh, there is such a sense of guilt and shame in not finishing the program and you can truly see this manifested in the very many, many people that leave the program. Some of them leave in the middle of the night without ever saying goodbye to anyone because they don't want to deal with the shame and the guilt. When I left, I actually felt proud in a sense for myself that I'd come to that hard conclusion. I didn't feel at all, even though I, f I felt felt terrible about the conclusion i didn't feel ashamed about my choice and so i said goodbye to everybody i remember i was at a there was a dinner and that just happened to be happening that weekend and i said goodbye to everybody because like i said the people there to me were very special and i can't really remember any other person ever saying goodbye you just kind of heard it like oh this you know such and such is no longer here such and such left the only other person i can remember saying goodbye to that left is my roommate and i said goodbye to her because we were in the same house so even if you heard of people like oh yeah you know i'm leaving and i'll leave in a week or anything they didn't say goodbye if you even heard that they were leaving it was probably you weren't probably meant to hear it unless you were their very close friend Again, because there was there was just this culture of shame and guilt surrounding leaving TFA. Next sign, there are records, books, news articles, TV programs that document the abuse of the group. You could just Google, should I join TFA? Why I quit TFA? You shouldn't join TFA. 
actually you might as well you you don't even have to actually because you're already watching this video and i'm documenting all the things that i went through next sign followers can never feel good enough again this is something i've already touched as well um there are such high expectations that even if you meet the expectation you can always be doing better you can always be doing more for your students more for the parents more for the organization more for anyone except yourself and again it's not like they come out and tell you these things it's just in the way that they present information to you the way that they regards themselves as being part of the organization these things are communicated to you indirectly this was actually one of the biggest struggles for me because i am already a perfectionist as it is in my everyday life and so i never felt good enough i never felt like my students were learning enough i never felt like i was a good enough teacher because i had the teachers that i want to be like in my head right the teachers that were most influential in my life i want to be them right and of course you're not going to be that on your first year but this constant demand to be exceptional and to then not achieve it because it probably doesn't even exist i'm doing i'm trying to be exceptional while i'm trying to learn to teach learn to communicate with my students, learn to deal with high school students, learn to deal with them being in a bad mood, being frustrated they don't want to do their homework, trying to learn how to grade papers, trying to balance having a life and, and doing all my work, doing lesson plans, creating interesting lessons. It was so much, so much going on that I never had a chance to actually just make myself feel good as a person. There was only feeling of I'm not enough, I'm not doing enough, I'm not working enough. And the final sign I pulled up from the internet was isolation. Again, I, even though I explained my entire story and reason for teaching and wanting to stay in LA, to TFA, they sent me to the other side of the country where I knew no one, where I didn't know the community that I was being placed in, where I had no context of, of how life works really on an everyday basis in Mississippi. Of course, being in this environment resulted in the worst depression I've ever felt. My family suffers from anxiety and depression and I've gone through bouts of depression in my life but i can tell you that that depression i felt while i was in tfa that's the worst depression i've ever felt in my life i remember thinking i read the bell jar when i was 16 and i didn't understand her sense of depression her the depth of her depression i didn't understand it until i was in tfa because that's how the depth of my re depression at the moment was manifested as it was very similar to how the bell jar was talking about depression and it wasn't just me i could see it in the faces of almost every other teacher the tfa teacher you could see their eyes were sunken in they were pale they were skinny there was just an overall lack of health of mental health in most of the teachers that were in that same situation because of course they're going through the exact same things that i'm going through and 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 all of us being in our early 20s because they don't really hire people that are experienced they don't really even though they say like yeah they will hire people that are experienced teachers they really don't they mostly just hire people in their early 20s that just graduated from college mostly not everyone but us being young for the most part the way that we knew how to cope with it was just to go out and party and, and drink and tfa has such a big party reputation because of course many of these people that are high achievers they're gonna they tend to be partiers at the same time um so it was just an overall very unhealthy experience and not everyone went out drinking i'm not saying that every person is out there like drinking trying to cope with their depression but i'm saying the general trend seemed to be that and i finally left because i wasn't unwilling to continue doing that um i don't even like drinking and i drank more in while well, i was in tfa for seven or eight months than i did I felt like I did I felt like I did more drinking in those months than I did my entire college career. 
<laughs> it probably it's probably not true because I went to school for like seven years. But on a such con it, I was I never drank on a such a high and consistent level for a prolonged period of time until I was in TFA. Anyway, this video is getting very long. Um, but ultimately, when I just finally made the brave choice to leave, was um, I actually had come back from Christmas. I spent Christmas in LA, and I remember just looking around like I'd never seen LA before. Um, and I just remember thinking, oh my god, I can't wait. You know, in two years, I'm gonna be back and I'm gonna do this and this, and in two years, I'll be doing this and this. And every time I said that, two years, some something inside myself kept saying, you don't have two years. You don't have two years. And I, I, am, I had to have been so anxious that I actually started to think that that voice was telling me I was gonna die. I didn't have two years of life. I still don't know what that voice was trying to tell me. It was just probably trying to tell me get the hell out of where you are right now because it's unhealthy. But I really started to believe that. I really started to believe that I didn't. If I didn't leave, I don't. I didn't know what was, what was going to happen to me. I I started realizing that I didn't even remember what made me happy anymore. I didn't even remember who I was anymore. And that's when I finally decided to leave TFA. Um, and when I decided to leave and I told my supervisors, they made it extremely difficult for me to leave. They accused me of lying, accused me of saying I have mental health problems because there's no way you can prove that you can have mental health problems. When actually you could prove it just by looking at me, looking at my face. I mean, I wish I had a picture and maybe I can go find back and maybe I should go back and find a picture, but I did not look healthy. So it's not like I couldn't prove it, it's, it, no, you're just making me feel, you're manipulating me. You, they were trying to make me feel guilty about coming to that conclusion. One of my supervisors told me, what's your legacy going to be if you leave TFA? Your legacy is going to be that you abandoned these children and that you didn't fight for educational inequality. Again, using guilt to manipulate me. And actually... I am, I am entirely happy that my legacy will be that I left TFA because I don't want to be a part of an organization that takes advantage of students and people that want to change the world in a positive way and just make money for themselves. I don't want to be part of that. So actually, I have no problem with that being in my legacy if I ever have any at all. I was also made feel bad that the fact that I could leave meant I had privilege. And I, I do agree with that. The fact that I can leave and that my students could not leave that, that situation in, in the school that they're at. And to me that was like so ridiculous because I'm not leaving because I'm privileged. I'm leaving because I cannot function as a human being on a daily basis. I cannot function in the way that I know that I function on a normal situation. In a normal situation. And the final and and worst tactic that they used to manipulate me to try to get me to stay was my supervisor kept saying well if you leave how are you going to pay back the money that you owe tfa because you have to pay it in one payment right away when you get back and that's actually a lie they gave me they gave you actually about eight to eight months to a year to pay off what you owe and i mean even if you pass those that period of time i mean all they're gonna do is just charge you interest most likely and you just have to pay it so again all of this is just further confirming the fact that they're trying to control my mind and trying to manipulate me they're trying to use guilt and yeah just guilt shame to get me to stay in a in a situation that is unhealthy for myself and i'm i i realized in that moment when all of this was happening that I was making the right choice for myself at least the only thing I truly feel bad about is about my students I feel like if by some divine miracle I'll, if one of them liked my class or maybe they liked studying Spanish and I took that away for the, from them that I feel terrible about that I will never forgive myself and that is the second worst mistake I've ever committed in my life right after joining TFA <laughs> but aside from that 
you know, I, I guess I came to the conclusion that you have to take care of yourself before you can help other people. And that's actually a very healthy thought, and I'm surprised I was able to come to that conclusion when I, in such an unhealthy state of my life. And of course, when I came home, my entire family just welcomed me and made me understand that I made the right choice. I should have never stayed there. I should have never been there so long if my health was so poor. Um, I wasn't doing any favors to the students. Actually, my students towards the end would always tell me like, you used to come to class in a good mood, what happened? And now you're always in a bad mood. And I couldn't even understand for so long because I was just walking around like a zombie because I didn't remember who I was. I didn't remember what made me feel good. And, and I hope that my students didn't take that personally. I didn't leave because of my students. I left because of, of me, because I, I needed to, to take care of myself. Unfortunately, they're probably harmed by it. And I'm very sorry for that, I really am. Um, but again, you have to take care of yourself before you can help other people. Unfortunately, I don't really have much of a solution in this video except that you shouldn't join Teach for America. If you truly want to change the educational system, you should learn how to be an amazing teacher the correct way. And if you're a student and you don't want to have Teach for America's teachers, I'm not really sure what you can do. Although I have heard there are many, many groups of students coming together um, to fight Teach for America, actually. And I don't know how how much um, how they can have influence but I imagine you and your parents can make sure can talk to your school and fight against having Teach for America come into your school if you're in a rural area um, you know this is a tough situation because sometimes there are actually shortages of teachers and so you know it, it's a tough situation all around but if I can inspire you to stop trying to take a shortcut like I did to being to making change happen in the world please do so please don't take a shortcut it's not really gonna work out in the best I don't think and like I said there are the amazing teachers that emerge from this crazy situation but I think the numbers are, are not very high in that regard so anyways I hope this video helped you um, thank you so much for watching if you still are I'm sorry it was such a long video uh, I had a lot to say Thank you, and I will see you soon. Come with me on this voyage, and we can fucking fuck some capitalists already. <laughs>